Vice Chancellor, fellow council members and staff of the university, graduates, ladies and gentlemen. To members of a university, a ceremony for the presentation of awards is a particularly important and happy occasion. To all of you, I extend a very warm welcome. To graduates, I offer congratulations and best wishes. The university's mission commits it to achieving international excellence in education and research. In the area of teaching and learning, the university aims to provide an education to all students which will equip them intellectually to the best international standards. The university's goal is to develop graduates whose knowledge, skills, abilities and attitudes are highly valued. Graduates who are able to contribute to the workplace and broader community and have the opportunity to lead rich and fulfilling lives. Whether you are here today to celebrate your first undergraduate degree, a postgraduate coursework degree, or the research higher degree of Doctor of Philosophy. You have acquired comprehensive and well-founded knowledge in the relevant discipline, appropriate professional knowledge and skills, the ability to think logically and laterally, critically and creatively, and to use these qualities effectively in decision-making and problem-solving. There are two critical tests of the quality of the education you have received from this university. One relates to your own satisfaction and the other to the satisfaction of those with whom you will work. As new graduates, you will have received the Graduate Careers Council of Australia's Graduate Destination Survey and the Course Experience Questionnaire. Responses to these two instruments by graduates from previous years demonstrates a very high level of satisfaction with their educational experience at the University of Newcastle. In addition, commencing salaries for Newcastle graduates continue to be higher than the national average, indicating that our graduates are highly competitive against those of other Australian universities. Employer satisfaction, as reported in the university's own employer survey, is also very positive. The speed and nature of change in our society today is such that whatever qualification you have completed, you will need to be engaged in lifelong learning, to be and remain successful and valued as a citizen and an employee or a manager. I am confident that the skills which you have acquired during your study at this university will stimulate the continuous search for more knowledge and understanding. These in turn will equip you to make significant contributions to the local, national, and I'm sure in the case of many, the international community. In the area of research, your university currently ranks ninth of the 39 public universities in Australia. It has an annual research income of about $25 million and a total annual expenditure on research projects, research scholarships and research infrastructure of about $35 million. This is an outstanding research achievement. I take this opportunity to remind those receiving their test aimers today that as graduates of the university, you automatically become members of the graduate body, the convocation. You thus join more than 50,000 other graduates worldwide and have an opportunity through elected representatives to become involved in the governance and the development of your university. I now call on the Acting Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Social Science to present graduates from that faculty. Chancellor, I present to you graduates of the degree of the Bachelor of Arts. Benjamin Arnott. Jennifer Agutis. Patrick Barry.
Samuel Bartlett. Karen Bell Christie. Eleanor Bush. Jill Karlstrom. Emma Carroll. Cherie Carter. Grant Cartwright. Claire Cherry. Daniel Close. Leon Clough. Catherine Darcy. Penny Deacon. Katrina Dorrington. Lisa Dewguide. Catherine Every Burns. Annette Finney. Kate Foster. Peter Foster. Jennifer Fraser. Stephen Friend. Lee Graham. Cherie Gregory. Mark Grimshaw. Susan Grzewski. <laughs> Kerry Lee Guest. <laughs> Maria Halaris. <laughs> Katrina Harmston. Angela Harvey. Michael Hurl. Jared Hector.
Susan Hill. Rose Horvai. Natalie Irwin. Maria Jackson. Nicole Janik. Karen Yankee. Stephen Jobson. Stephen Kerry. Alicia Casera. Jennifer Lamarchant. <laughs> Stuart Ma. <laughs> Elaine Mascord. <laughs> Mark McCaffrey. Kate Myers. <laughs> Roslyn Mills. <laughs> Tracy Mortimer. <laughs> Carolyn Moss. Erin Murray. <laughs> Jennifer Murray. <laughs> Dilair Musatafa. <laughs> Beth Norman. Reese North. <laughs> Natasha Norton. <laughs> Melanie O'Brien. <laughs> Julius Parker. Sean Perrett. <laughs> Kim Probert. <laughs> Sky Ravenscroft. Fiona Reagan. <laughs> Alicia Richards. <laughs> Tammy Richardson. <laughs> Jane Russell. Jad Sanson Fisher. <laughs> Lee.
Leela Sazdanov. Michelle Scott. Gillian Searant. Helene C. Andrew Sheely. Marie Schindler. Nicola Simpson. Tanya Smith. Belinda Surley. Matthew Squire. Megan Stanley. Tanya Stodjanov. Tony Sunnell. Jason Tempake. Erin Taylor. Wan Ching Tio. Marnie Thomas. Rebecca Turner. Leah Turvey. Barbara Vandenberg. Gillian Vine. Kim Wall. Rachel Watts. Evan Williams. Dawn Wilson. Neville Wilson. Jane Wood. <laughs> Chancellor, I present to you graduates for the award of the degrees of Bachelor of Arts and Bachelor of Commerce. The graduates have studied for both awards simultaneously. Melinda Nunn. <laughs> Chancellor, I present to you a graduate for the award of the degrees of Bachelor of Arts and Bachelor of Science. The graduate has studied for both awards simultaneously. Rebecca St. George. <laughs> Chancellor, I present to you graduates of the degree of Bachelor of Arts, Communication Studies. Leah Ainsworth.
Rebecca Ali. Rachel Ambrose. Amy Ang. Donna Anthes. Lisa Marie Bailey. Linda Barnier. Carly Baston. Michelle Baumgartner. Mary Belewska. Carrie Birch. Samantha Brooks. Christy Bryant. Emma Buckley. Catherine Chad. <laughs> Eleanor Chuan. <laughs> Kelly Collier. <laughs> Leisha Davis. Holly Dixon. Michael John Doyle. Lisa May Driscoll. Paul Dunn. Rebecca Dunn. <laughs> Rowan Everingham. <laughs> Lauren Finger. <laughs> Lauren Foreman. Kate Gardner. Andrew Gibbons. Sharon Gilson. Lindsay Gosper. Erin Gray. <laughs> Blythe Hamilton. <laughs> Kirsty Hampson. <laughs> Scott Harrison.
Catherine Hunter. Rebecca Jarvie. May Tan. John Caligonis. Holly Keating. Michelle Keogh. Gemina Koziel. Karen Lantry. Catherine Lill. Nathaniel Little. Sinyi Lo. Kristen Mackey. Joan Maddox. Katie McGriplis. Emily Maximovich. Amy Mark. Zoe Marsh. Jody McEwen. Sarah McGregor. Marika Meehan. Rebecca Olenek. Renee Orr. Catherine Passfield. Catherine Patterson. Christy Porter. Cherie Primer. Suzanne Pritchard. Amelia Robertson. Rebecca Robertson. Elizabeth Seskus. Marianne Shields. Kate Sims. Megan Solobodnik. Katie Smith.
Stephanie Sonlight. Adam Spark. Louise Spears. James Stewart. Alexander Sutherland. Christina Tullock. Lisa Walsh. Danielle White. Chancellor, I present to you a graduate of the degree of Bachelor of Arts, Communication Studies, with honours, Class 1, Rosemary Ollier. <laughs> Chancellor, I present to you graduates of the degree of Bachelor of Arts, Psychology, Kylie Bear. Amy Crookshanks. Jane Virginia Love Dan. Louisa Giannakis. Rebecca Morris. Jasmine Naden. Jason O'Connor. Sharon Palmer. Samara Rabb. Chancellor, I present to you graduates of the degree of Bachelor of Arts Psychology with honours, Class 2, Division 1, Andrew Bailey. <laughs> Melinda Bath. <laughs> Sharon Craig. Sally Crockett. Sarah Dean. Ashley Douglas. Benjamin Fletcher. Lynn Fox. Lisa Fraser. Debbie Haymans. Alison Ma. Catherine McGill. Janice Mackay. Jane Ween.
Alexandra Patterson. Nicole Reed. Emma Sinclair. Glenda Walker. Nolene Wilding. Alison Zucker. Chancellor, I present to you graduates of the degree of Bachelor of Arts Psychology with honours, class one. Sarah Swanson. <laughs> Susanna Tiller. <laughs> Tracy Turnbull. Chancellor, a university medal may be awarded to a candidate who has achieved first class honours and displayed outstanding academic ability. In assessing ability, the graduate's record throughout the whole degree course is taken into account. In addition to achieving consistently high grades, the graduate must have completed at least half of their degree requirements at this university. Chancellor, I present to you graduates of the degree of Bachelor of Arts, Psychology, with honours, Class 1, and the University Medal. Carlo Caponeccia. Naomi Gad. <laughs> Chancellor, I present to you graduates of the degree of Bachelor of Arts, Visual Arts, Ronald Bell. Bianca Boss. <laughs> Natalie Cross. <laughs> Brayden Gifford. <laughs> Amos Hong. David Kurtzlow. <laughs> Beng Lim. <laughs> Melissa Norris. <laughs> Fiona Robbie. Chancellor, I present to you graduates of the degree of Bachelor of Social Science with honours, Class 1. Rachel Buchanan. <laughs> Patricia Johnson. <laughs> Mika O'Connor. Catherine Simmons. <laughs> Ch 
Chancellor, I present to you graduates of the degree of Bachelor of Social Science, Recreation and Tourism. Alison Battle. <laughs> Tracy Beaton. <laughs> Mary Bullock. Stephen Cowan. Brooke Cronin. Amanda Jane Delaforce. Joanne Flanagan. Casey Harris. Jade Herring. Danielle Hollington. Jill Cable. Kylie Laughlin. <laughs> Olivia Meek. <laughs> Brooke Meeluk. <laughs> Candice Nguyen. Judith Norman. <laughs> Megan O'Doherty. <laughs> Roxana Olivares. <laughs> Sean Pearson. Kylie Peterson. Sarah Purvis. Katie Pine. Priscilla Radici. Yana Rodwell. <laughs> Jennifer Rumming. <laughs> Raylene Russell. <laughs> Matthew Spanko. Peter Strong. <laughs> Kelly Sutter. <laughs> Melanie Thomas. <laughs> Michelle Turner. Lisa Warrington. <laughs> Chancellor, 
that concludes the presentation of graduates from the Faculty of Arts and Social Science. I now call on the Dean of the Faculty of Science and Mathematics to present graduates from that faculty. Chancellor, I present to you graduates of the degree of Bachelor of Science, Aviation, Jean Bevitt. Bradley McKenzie. Marcus Riley. Mark Rowell. Mark Sorens. Matthew Sheen. Glenn Somerville. Wojciech Zosborek. <laughs> Chancellor, I present to you graduates of the degree of Bachelor of Science, Psychology, Anne-Marie Baker. <laughs> Ayesha Bromley. Adam Coates. <laughs> Jody Legg. <laughs> Catherine McCabe. <laughs> Christy McPhee. Leanne Morris. <laughs> Sally Ramke. <laughs> Helen Sklavos. <laughs> Jody Smallman. Renee Souter. <laughs> Chancellor, I present to you graduates of the degree of Bachelor of Science Psychology with honours class two, division one, Rebecca Atkinson. <laughs> Melinda Lang. Natalie Louis. <laughs> Catherine Martin. <laughs> Christy Mitchell. <laughs> David Richards. Chancellor, I present to you graduates of the degree of Bachelor of Science Psychology with honours class one, Tracy Allen. <laughs> Cherie Harrison. <laughs> Brendan Knott.
Bronwyn Shields. <laughs> Wendy Stoyanov. <laughs> Catherine Younger. Chancellor, I present to you graduates of the degree of Master of Applied Psychology, Vanessa Dodd. <laughs> Mari Hilton. <laughs> Louise Metcalf. Chancellor, that concludes the presentation of graduates from the Faculty of Science and Mathematics. I call on the Deputy Vice-Chancellor to present research higher degree graduates. Chancellor. I present to you Kim Freeman for the degree of Master of Psychology Clinical. Ms Freeman's thesis is entitled The Relationship Between Hardiness, Neuroticism, Emotional Intelligence and Health Status in a Sample of Working Adults. Chancellor Kim Freeman. Chancellor, I present to you Peter McRae for the degree of Master of Psychology Clinical. Mr McRae's thesis is entitled, Changes in Psychological Functioning Associated with Pre-Vocational Psychiatric Rehabilitation, an Evaluation of the Capinta Vocational Rehabilitation Program. Chancellor. Peter McRae. Chancellor, the degree of Doctor of Philosophy is awarded to graduates who have successfully completed a prescribed program of study, principally by research. A thesis embodying the outcomes of that research is the principal basis of examination. The degree is only awarded if the thesis makes a significant and an original contribution to knowledge and understanding in the field of knowledge with which it is concerned. Today the University is proud to honour Doctor of Philosophy graduates who have satisfied these rigorous criteria for the award of their degree. Chancellor, I present to you Gwyneth Barnes, a Bachelor of Education and Master of Educational Studies at this University. Dr Barnes' thesis is entitled, Peter Scholthorpe, Teacher and Composer, A Study in Duality. Gwyneth Barnes. Chancellor, I present to you Robert Evans, a Bachelor of Medicine and Bachelor of Surgery of the University of Adelaide. Dr Evans' thesis is entitled, Paediatrics in New South Wales, 1945 to 1965. Chancellor, Dr Robert Evans. <laughs> Chancellor. I present to you Catherine Lay, Bachelor of Arts with Honours of this University. Dr Lay's thesis is entitled, Significant Acts, Low Comedians and Leading Actors on and off the Australian Stage. Chancellor, Dr Catherine Lay. on and off the stage. <laughs> Chancellor.
I present to you Robert McGregor, Bachelor of Arts with Honours of this university. Dr McGregor's thesis is entitled The Nation's Navy, Nationalism, Patriotism and Representations of the Royal Navy in Great Britain, circa 1730 to 1793. Chancellor, Dr Robert McGregor. Chancellor, I present to you Sean Saunders, who is a Bachelor of Arts Psychology with honours of this university. Dr Saunders' thesis is entitled, An Examination of Fromm's 1955 Marketing Character and Materialistic Attitudes and Their Relationship to Psychological Health and Contemporary Issues. Chancellor, Dr Mark, uh, Sean Saunders. Chancellor, that concludes the presentation of research higher degree graduates. I now call upon the Vice Chancellor to present a candidate for an honorary degree. Chancellor, I have pleasure in presenting to you Kenneth Raymond Dutton for admission to the degree of Doctor of Letters, Honoris Causa. Chancellor, Kenneth Raymond Dutton was born in Sydney in 1938 into a working class family. He attended Sydney Boys High School where he achieved first class honours in English, French and German. In 1958, Ken Dutton completed a Bachelor of Arts degree with honours at the University of Sydney majoring in French with sub-majors in English and German. After teaching French at Cranbrook School, Ken Dutton completed his Master of Arts degree with a thesis on the work of Henri Bramond and Paul Valéry. For this piece of unsupervised research work, he was awarded the degree with First Class Honours and the University Medal. Raised as an Anglican, Ken Dutton was always conscious of the wider world, including Catholicism, Catholic art and literature. As an undergraduate, he became involved with the Sydney University Anglican Society and became drawn to the Catholic expression of Anglicanism. In 1961, he left for Paris, where he undertook a doctorate on the notion of natural spirituality in its relations with poetic inspiration, considering the work of Maritain, Dubot, and Bramond. In 1962, Ken Dutton's father died, leaving Ken the sole breadwinner of the family. He had to return to Australia, but prohibitive costs meant that he could not then undertake return to France to complete his doctorate. This therefore spurred him on to submit his doctoral thesis in the record time of 18 months. Notwithstanding the need to accelerate completion, the quality of the work was not diminished. Ken Dutton received the outstanding grade of mention très honorable for the thesis. Ken Dutton subsequently accepted appointments as senior tutor and dean of students at St Paul's College in the, at the University of Sydney and subsequently senior lecturer at Macquarie University. In 1969, Ken Dutton was appointed as a professor of French at this university. From 1969 to 1975, he performed the duties of the head of the Department of French. This was followed by administrative positions as head of the Department of Modern Languages, Dean Faculty of Arts, Acting Dean Faculty of Architecture, Vice Principal and Deputy Vice Chancellor, and Pro Vice Chancellor and Dean of Students. On completion of his second term of office as Pro Vice Chancellor in 1993, Ken Dutton returned as Head of the Department of Modern Languages and inaugural director of the Hartley Bequest Program. The program involved scholarships, fellowships and publications made possible by the generous legacy of Kelva Hartley. During the final years of his life, Kelva Hartley lived as a pauper, having acquired a substantial portfolio of shares which gradually grew in value and which he intended to leave as a gift to the University of Newcastle upon his death. The Bequest was aimed at providing the opportunity for recent graduates in French to travel to France in order to continue their studies. As the Hartley Bequest has been made to the University in perpetuity, one of Ken Dutton's first tasks as director was to piece together material to create a permanent record of Kelva Hartley. The resulting volume, Kelva Hartley, a memoir, was published in 1995. As might be expected, Ken Dutton served on numerous university committees and boards, including the university's Animal Care and Ethics Committee. In this role, it was necessary for him to become familiar 
with relevant scientific and medical literature. This accompanied by, accompanied by a fitness program he had developed led Ken to pursue an interest in human physiology. In his book, The Perfectible Body, The Western Ideal of Physical Development, Ken Dutton integrated his knowledge of physical development with his other interests, including theology, cultural history, and aesthetic theory. Ken Dutton has also been a prolific writer in the fields of languages, poetry, theology, cultural history, and university administration. Most recently, in 2000, Ken Dutton completed a biography of James Okmuti, the university's foundation vice-chancellor, entitled Okmuti, The Life of James Johnston Okmuti, 909-1981. Ken Dutton's distinguished academic career has been rec uh, recognised by his election as a Fellow of the Australian College of Education for achievements in educational administration. In 1983, Ken Dutton received the award of Officer de Lorde de Balmes Académique, sorry about that, Ken, uh, from the Government of France. Uh, this is an award recognising distinguished academic service as conferred at three levels. The fact that the award was conferred at the level of officer, the middle of the three levels rather than at the lowest level, which is the level more usually granted to a professor from an overseas country, is a reflection of the very high regard in which Ken Dutton is held as a scholar in French. In 1997, in recognition of his contribution to French-Australian cultural relations through the Alliance Française and the Association Culturelle Franco-Australienne, Ken Dutton was awarded the City of Paris Medal. In acknowledgement of his outstanding contributions to scholarship and leadership in this university, the Council conferred on Ken Dutton the title of Emeritus Professor upon his retirement in 1998. Chancellor, it is with great pleasure that I present to you Kenneth Raymond Dutton, Bachelor of Arts with Honours, Master of Arts with Honours and University Medal from the University of Sydney, Doctor de la University from the University of Paris, Fellow of the Australian College of Education, Officer de l'Ordre de Palmes Académique of Paris, holder of the City of Paris Medal for the award of the degree of Doctor of Letters, Honoris Causa. By the authority delegated in me by the Council, I hereby admit Kenneth Raymond Dutton to the degree of Doctor of Letters Honoris Causa. We will now have a musical interlude presented by Adam Manning from the Faculty of Music. Mr. Manning will perform his own composition, Fly. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Adam Manning. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to invite Emeritus Professor Ken Dutton to deliver the occasional address. Chancellor, Vice-Chancellor, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, one of the privileges of what might euphemistically be called my maturer years has been, as the Vice-Chancellor has mentioned, to administer the magnanimous bequest left to us by my predecessor in the Chair of French, Professor Kelva Hartley. The $2 million Hartley bequest enables the University of Newcastle to offer to senior students of French the most generous scholarships for study in France of any university in any country of the Commonwealth. Needless to say, I'm often inundated with inquiries from students in other universities as to whether they may be eligible to apply for a Hartley scholarship, to which I'm obliged to reply that under the terms of Professor Hartley's will, these awards are restricted to students and recent graduates of the University of Newcastle. Having become today, and being still as of this moment, the most recent graduate of the University of Newcastle, I find it gratifying to think that I myself am now eligible to apply <laughs> for a Hartley Scholarship. <laughs> but I can assure you that there are many other reasons why I'm both delighted and honoured to be a graduate of the University of Newcastle. Delighted because of my affection for this institution with which I have an association going back for well over 30 years. And also honoured, as I hope are my fellow graduates today, because of my respect for a university which does not suffer in comparison with any other tertiary institution in this country. Notwithstanding the hubris of the self-selected and self-styled great eight universities from which we are excluded, but would not have been had they decided instead on the fine nine. <laughs> In any case, I'm deeply grateful to the University Council for its decision to admit me to the ranks of Newcastle graduates. As a survivor, of graduation ceremonies too numerous to mention, I have over the years become more and more pessimistic as to the prospect that anything the guest speaker says will make any impression at all on the minds of those who are his or her captive audience. My one recollection of my first such occasion when I left high school was that the guest speaker, a military man, told the boys to pull their socks up a phrase memorable only because of my inability to determine whether it was meant figuratively or literally. Perhaps the most memorable graduation address I've ever heard in this great hall occurred some years ago when the speaker was a very distinguished but very ancient lady who was an emeritus professor from another university and who kept referring to Newcastle as Adelaide. <laughs> Once again, the memorable nature of the speech was enhanced by the audience's uncertainty as to whether she was simply recycling one of her old addresses <laughs> and would suddenly realise her error in the middle of the speech and be covered in embarrassment, or whether perhaps she really did believe she was in Adelaide. <laughs> and we never found out. But I sometimes think that the most memorable advice ever given on such an occasion was that given at an American college graduation in the 1960s by their guest speaker, the comedian Bob Hope. He said, now you've got your degrees, you're all going out into the real world. I've been there, don't go. <laughs> but there is one major difference between what I've just quoted and what is appropriate today, because the speeches I've quoted were all made at a time when a group of graduates such as this would have been made up almost exclusively of young men and women, the great majority of whom had been full-time students 
well supported by the taxpayers' contributions. Compare that with the situation of many, possibly even a majority, of you, my fellow graduates today. You have not enjoyed the luxury of life as a full-time student. You've had to work at your university studies part-time, supporting yourself through part-time or casual employment. And your graduation means that you now have to think about repayment of your HECS liability before you can put any money aside for other things. Some others of you have known the sacrifice entailed in undertaking a second or third degree with perhaps the uncertainties of academic life to follow. I take my hat off to you. And I know that you have no need of homilies or advice from me. Perhaps the only thing I can presume to say to you is, congratulations, well done, I'm happy for you. And so I am. But perhaps I might just dwell for a moment on this change that has taken place in the situation of students in a faculty such as this over the last generation. On the one hand, there have been positive as well as negative consequences of the need of many students to hold down a job and work their way through university. After all, the purpose of study in the humanities and social sciences is to be trained in understanding and explicating the society around us what we sometimes call the real world. And there's no better basis for that study than first-hand exposure to the real world itself. On the other hand, I feel that much has also been lost in the generational change that has taken place with the increasing prevalence of the doctrine known as user pays. That is, the notion that since you are the ones who will benefit from your tertiary studies, you and not the taxpayers, are the ones that should pay for them. This doctrine is founded ultimately on the idea that nothing matters except the individual, that the broader concept we know as society is purely secondary, or even, as Margaret Thatcher famously stated, that there is no such thing as society, that there are only collections of individuals. It follows on this view that education is purely a private good, of benefit solely to the individual. Swept away, then, is the understanding that education may also be a public good, that an educated society is a goal worth striving for in itself. In this country, the gradual erosion of the public dimension of education first became discernible in respect of higher education in the mid-1980s. In more recent times, in relation to secondary education, the ever-increasing shift of government funding from the public sector to the private school sector has been a further symptom of the same mindset as our former Deputy Chancellor Justice Michael Kirby has recently, and not without some controversy, pointed out. What are the repercussions of this societal shift? Quite apart from the reduction in the funding of public educational institutions, secondary or tertiary, I fear that there could well be significant effects on the attitude of those who pass through these institutions. In a nutshell, if, unlike my generation, you have paid for your own education from your own financial resources with only a minimal contribution from the public purse, why should you feel any moral obligation to give anything back to society in return? The recent decision of the US Supreme Court that incorporatized medical practices, such as we're increasingly seeing in Australia, the obligation of doctors to maximize profits for their employers takes precedence over the well-being of their patients is a signal example of this increasing shift towards private benefit at the expense of social responsibility. Let me now make a different but related point. As one who for some years had the privilege of being on the selection committee for New South Wales Rhodes scholarships, it has long been one of my great disappointments that the University of Newcastle is yet to produce its first Rhodes Scholar. Contrary to popular belief, the Rhodes Scholarship, probably the most prestigious of all student awards, does not require unusual sporting prowess. What is looked for in potential Rhodes Scholars is an excellent academic record combined with a record of public service, of beneficial involvement 
in the world outside oneself. Now, I don't believe that the best of Newcastle students are any less talented than those of other institutions or that they are any less socially committed. What worries me, however, is that while Newcastle students may not be lacking ability or the will to give voluntarily of their time, the harsh fact is that for many of them, their socio-economic situation is such that their time outside study is entirely taken up by the need to make a living, to make both ends meet, in some cases to care for a family. They're simply unable to find the time for major engagement in public service in addition to their other commitments. In a recent address to the National Press Club, the Vice-Chancellor of the University of Sydney, Professor Gavin Brown, in support of his oft-repeated assertion that the GO8, the group of eight, or so-called great eight universities, have the best students in Australia, quoted the fact that 95% of Australian Rhodes Scholars have come from GO8 universities. He might well have added that all the students listed for this year's New South Wales Rhodes Scholarship were from the University of Sydney. Though I don't have the statistics, my experience on the Rhodes Committee would make me very surprised if they hadn't all gone to the more expensive private schools. Now, if you're a University of Sydney student from Darling Point, Edgecliff or Point Piper, where the average taxable income is $93,620 a year, you may well have a freedom from financial pressure, which is not shared in some Newcastle suburbs where the annual income may be as low as $26,500. Even the highest earning Newcastle suburbs have an income less than half of the more affluent areas of Sydney. In an age when the gap between rich and poor in this country has never been greater, this disparity appears to be increasing even further. And in any case, while higher socioeconomic status might pro provide greater opportunities for public-spirited contributions to society, it's worrying to think that recent studies by the Queensland University of Technology have shown that of those Australians with a taxable income over $1 million, almost 40% did not claim any charitable donations on their tax returns in 1998-99. In fact, the vast bulk of charitable support in this country comes from people with modest to low incomes. It is clear then that the average Novocastrian battler is on average making a greater contribution to the social good of this country than the silver tails of the capital cities. So let me return to my main theme. I remain unshaken in my conviction that Newcastle students and indeed today's graduates are the equal of those anywhere in Australia in terms both of ability and social commitment. If the odds are stacked against them, it's largely on socio-economic grounds. And so for those of you who have not had the opportunity for public service that comes with financial security and family wealth, who've had to work your way through your university years, my wish is twofold. First, that that experience of the real world will bring you its own rewards. In particular, an enhanced sense of your achievement in having succeeded against such odds. And second, that your own individual struggle will not blind you to the need to contribute as an educated person and a university graduate to the social fabric of this city and this country. In this context, and at the risk of slightly overrunning the time, Chancellor, that's been allocated to me, I can't let the moment pass without mentioning and paying tribute to the late John Lambert, who died just a week ago. One of the earliest members of staff of this university, he was a model to all of us in terms of service of the public good. His service on the board of the university union, on convocation, and in particular in the Friends of the University, are a signal example of what I'm referring to when I talk about putting something back into society rather than simply taking what society has to offer. He is sorely missed. To come back then to where I began these remarks, the Hartley bequest, it is not, alas, the Rhodes Scholarship. It's a great deal more modest in scope. The University of Newcastle is, moreover, relatively lacking in benefactors and endowments. 
But what the Hartley bequest does is to remind us in perpetuity that there are still people in the world like Kel the Hartley, who in his retirement lived in extreme poverty so that many generations of Newcastle students could benefit from his sense of the public good, of what transcends the self-interest of the individual and works for the good of society as a whole. Perhaps in years to come, there will be many more public-spirited benefactors, such as Kelva Hartley and John Lambert, who will help level the playing field for Newcastle and its students. That, at any rate, is my hope for a university of which I'm proud to be a member in a new capacity today as one of its graduates. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Dutton, for those stirring words. I must say I agree with you that uh, this university ranks at least with anyone in the group of eight, and uh, your words of public service and advice to the students, the graduates today, I think are very well taken. Thank you very much indeed. I now have great pleasure in inviting Gwyneth Barnes to speak on behalf of the graduates. Chancellor, Vice-Chancellor, members of the Council, staff of the University, families and friends of graduates, and most importantly, graduates. I am delighted to be speaking today on behalf of the graduates, and I would like to congratulate them on their outstanding achievements. Each one of them has made a valuable contribution to the University, and today they celebrate their many and varied successes. My experiences may not mirror those of the graduates, but they may remind them of various aspects of both the struggles and the highlights that have occurred in the courses of their studies. After completing a Bachelor of Music Education, I was pleased to see the end of my student days. Despite the happy times, I needed a break from lectures and assignments. I enjoyed many of the subjects, but some were difficult to endure. First year history seemed particularly dull and my lack of enthusiasm was reflected in my results. I had not heard of plagiarism and was sure that the footnoting was optional. <laughs> I was proud of my first essay that year and felt confident that I would do well. I sat with great expectation as the essays were returned. My excitement, however, was short-lived. I was unprepared for the lecturer's comment. I refuse to mark this travesty of an essay any longer. But continuing to the end, she added appropriate references and even more appropriate sarcasm, <laughs> failed me and then held the essay up in front of the class as an example of how not to write a history essay. Had I taken her comments to heart, I most certainly would not be standing here today. In 1990, I had the opportunity to enrol in a master's program. Feeling somewhat apprehensive, I questioned my ability to succeed, but with no examinations to deter me, I decided to proceed. In the early stage, it was difficult to determine a suitable thesis proposal. Upon the advice of a fellow student, I arranged an interview with Professor John Ramsland, affectionately known by some as the fairy godfather. His breadth of knowledge and ability to make interconnections was impressive, so I decided to venture into the world of historical investigation. Through his encouragement, scholarly advice and kind words, I discovered my love of writing and for this I cannot thank him enough. There are many exciting opportunities for students wishing to pursue postgraduate studies. In 1998, I was fortunate enough to receive funding that allowed me to travel to England with Peter Sculthorpe. Through participation in the Dartington International Summer School and Festival of Music in Devon, 
I gained an understanding of Skullcorp's international reputation as a composer and teacher. I interviewed musicologists, composers, conductors and performers who openly discussed his use of an extended tonal language and the way that it reflects the Australian landscape. While observing him at work with students in the advanced composition course, I gathered invaluable material for my thesis. Skullthorpe has influenced generations of composers in this country, and the early development of ethnomusicology can be largely attributed to his pioneering work at the University of Sydney. It has been an enormous privilege to undertake such research. My experience as a student at the University of Newcastle has been highly rewarding, and I am sure that most, if not all, of my fellow graduates here today would feel the same. At the postgraduate level, students are given more responsibility in the setting and pursuit of their goals, and original thought is encouraged further. I have found this area to be one of great personal satisfaction and I would thoroughly recommend that you seek to continue your studies in the future. There is support not only from individual supervisors and departments, but also through the many ancillary staff members. I would like to thank the History Department and John Ramsland in particular, and the staff of the Research Higher Degree section for their commitment and assistance over the past three years. Fellow graduates, I share your excitement as the conferring of these degrees represents an ending, but more importantly, the beginning of a new phase in our lives. Thank you. Gwyneth Barnes, thank you very much for your speech. I shall remember John Ramsland as a fairy godfather. <laughs> Next time I meet him, I'm sure. I now declare this ceremony concluded. May I invite all present to join us for a cold drink in the marquee adjoining the Great Hall. The University Union also invites you to make your way towards the shortened Union building where Devonshire tea will be served and no doubt many other things. You will also be able to order photographs, have your test aimers framed and view a range of university memorabilia for sale and no doubt enjoy the afterglow of having achieved the first part of your new life. Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes the proceedings. <laughs>